and my book sales, which are rising like that, would collapse. The end of a bestseller. So, Larry King may be a very good interviewer, but he was completely the wrong choice for Marlon Brando, who started off on wild riffs about Native Americans and the environment. And, you know, I wouldn't touch anything to do with acting, or oh, everybody's an actor, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> so, and so then, uh, at, so when I was in uh, the end of my time at the Sunday Times, I got a literary agent sent me a a bundle of clips. Now, I was continually besieged by a literary agent sending me clips to give this person a job, give this person a review front, which was the marvellous place. And I put these at the bottom of my briefcase and never bothered till a week later or so with the latest that had been sent to me. And um, the, um, I finally, one morning, I felt really guilty because I came across these columns and I thought they were marvellous. They were in Punch magazine, the literary comic magazine, and in the Oxford magazine. And they were by a woman called Tina Brown, who was, had gone to Oxford at the age of 16 as a child prodigy. And uh, her agent was a beautiful woman called Pat Kavanagh, who's now not with us, unfortunately, who was married to Julian Barnes. Julian Barnes was my television critic on the Sunday Times. So I read these pieces, I thought they were absolutely tremendous, so I thought I must ring up, I must ring up this child prodigy and say, tell her I like the comms. The conversation went like this. Brown's column about a lunch at Private Eye was hilarious. I'd normally have passed it to Ian Jack, the editor of our Look feature page, in what used to be the women's section. But feeling guilty at my neglect in reading the submission, I got on the phone at once to tell Miss Brown that I much and enjoyed her writing and would like her to come and meet Mr. Jack. I was so pleased you liked my column, she said, but sorry, not today. My husband has friends coming round for dinner. Wait a minute. Child prodigy, married before she'd even left Oxford. Wasn't that carrying precocity too far? She went on to ask how I'd come across her writing in a Spanish magazine. It transpired that Tina Brown I was talking to was known to her husband as Tina, but she was Bettina Brown, indeed a sharp writer, but Tina Brown's mother. The husband whose dinner party took priority over the needs of the Sunday Times was celebrated Pinewood film producer Gordon Brown. So anyway, she came in, the real Tina Brown, and um, she did very well. The features people liked her, she did some columns. And then the editor of the features said to me, that young woman, Tina Brown, is going to go to America. Uh, I don't know anybody in America. Do you have any names? Well, I thought the State Department, military stuff. No, I don't. Uh, I thought I know just the right person. I'd just recently met a famous New Yorker called S.J. Perelman, crazy like a fox. Very, very funny New Yorker writer. So I wrote to him. I said, the woman, she was, Tina Brown was blonde and she'd won the Sunday Times Drama Award. Nothing, I had no influence on that. The critics chose her. And I wrote to Sid Perlman. I said, dear, Mr. dear Sid, I said, um, you know, we said Perlman is. The results two months later was a cross letter from Perlman. I don't know why I'm being cordial to a man who wrote me way back in November that a beautiful blonde playwright who had won your drama award was coming here and would phone me. The only blonde I've seen around here is a Polish maid with fat thighs and no chest who permanently spills ammonia on my suede shoes. This can't be the woman you mentioned, Harry, or else you have a low opinion of me as a judge of feminine sexuality. Was Tina real or merely the product of an erotic opium dream? So he forgave me, and when they met, they became best friends. And, of course, eventually I got married to Tina, etc., etc., etc. And I went to Random House, signed up a lot of books, and I was very glad. I mean, I encourage the staff to come up with books. Sometimes we, we publish some marvellous books. Sometimes they cost a lot of money. I've done an analysis in here of the books that made money and those that didn't, and it's very, very surprising, actually. But I was always plaid glad to publish good books because as Jason Epstein said as we signed away a book uh, for $200,000 I think on the Spanish Inquisition he said this book will be read long after we're all dead well it was no consolation to me when I faced the board with losses but nonetheless I thought he's absolutely right let's go ahead and do it so when Peter Osnos was a young editor uh, the young editor called Henry Ferris uh, came up one day 
and they wanted to publish a book by an unknown man whose book had been rejected by Simon and Schuster because he'd been late delivering it and hadn't delivered it on time. And um, so I said, well, what does this guy do? He said, well, he's a community organizer. I said, well, $40,000 for a community organizer whose book has already been rejected. Uh, and he said, well, he does it pretty well at Harvard. I said, okay, well, let me read it. Well, I read it, of course. I was totally blown away. The writing was so superb. The best writing I'd seen all year. So I said, right, buy it. And, of course, Dreams from My Father by Barack Obama is now the mainstay of Random House Publishing House. So if I do nothing else, I'm proud of signing that. And recently my wife met Barack. I didn't, but she met him. And... Uh, she said very nicely, you know my, uh, Mr. President, my, this was actually the, before the inauguration, the night before, he said, my husband signed your contract, book contract, and he gave one of his radiant smiles and he said, it's worth a lot more now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for listening to me. <laughs> if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. I'd also like a drink. <laughs> hey. Um, so you said earlier that... Um, oh, hi. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you said earlier that um, Murdoch fired you, so I'm not sure how this question is going to go. But uh, I don't mind. Whatever you um, want. What do you think of him uh, withdrawing the journal from uh, Google searches? Do you think who? That's a good uh, uh, who? Who? Uh, Murdoch with, withdrew. I'm not sure. If I'm Google right. did. Uh, Murdoch. No, no, Murdoch withdrew the journal from Google searches. I think just sort of. Well, you know, you know. what my view of him, I wrote a book called Good Times, Bad Times, which is pretty fierce, actually, in criticizing mm -hmm. him because of political interference. My view, uh, because he'd signed promises about political freedom and so on. So it was rather a special case. A lot of American friends said, you can't object to proprietors sacking you. I said, I can when he made promises about political independence. Big difference. I don't... What he does in his business dealing or what he does in his Fox News or what he does in newspapers, I actually don't get dramatic about it and say he should be strangled, stopped, censored, abused in the streets, whatever. It's part of the free flow of information and all the, and the best answer uh, to crap is disinfectant. In other words, the best answer to that is things which are much more positive. And I've always felt that when in England the, some of the tabloid papers in England were published in the most appalling stuff and I'd criticise them, uh, which wasn't done in the profession, dog does not eat dog. But I always felt at the end of the day that what we must do is show what good journalism can do. And ju good journalism is so important. Good reporting is the absolute essence of American freedom and British freedom. And you've got the First Amendment, and unfortunately you've got a diminishing amount of reporting in this country, which worries me greatly. And so that's my answer to that, really. I don't mind. You see, even I was asked today in an interview, what do you think about the White House criticizing Fox. I said, great, let them criticize, but Fox has got its own answer if it wants to reply. MSNBC can run something. Let all the flowers bloom and let the truth emerge from this vigorous argument, which is characteristic of American democracy. So you, you forgive me sounding patronizing, but many Americans don't realize just how free this country is by comparison with every other country in the world. I'm not talking about China. I'm talking about democracies. In England, we still have prior restraint. Let me give you an example. I was with the Guardian editor uh, about a month ago. Uh, and I said, how are you getting on with investigative journalism? Alan Rusbridger. And he said, well, we're doing pretty well. We've just come across a fantastic scandal of the dumping of toxic waste in polluting and endangering lives. I said, when are you publishing it? He said, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? He said, because the company went before a judge and the judge said, I'm injuncting you not to publish this information. Now, there's no such, that's prior.